Okay, time to do some more work on this. So the story so far is that I am porting EmuTOS, a re-implementation of Atari TOS, to my Alpha Smart Dana laptop thing. And last time I got it up to the point where it was starting up and making a certain amount of progress before stopping because I couldn't interact with it. And if you've seen the last video, you'll notice that this screen here is not what it was showing last time. I don't know why it's doing that now. I suspect that I had a inconsistent build due to changing some of the various options and not doing a make clean in between. Have I mentioned how much I dislike make? But this is nice because it's actually showing the proper Emutos splash screen. So what we're going to do today is to try and make it so that we can interact with this because currently it's not listening to the serial port. The serial port in Emutos is interrupt driven so we will have to get interrupt set up and we'll also have to get timers working which is lots of interrupt handling code and we're going to do this with the help of the datasheet for the CPU and turns out that this CPU has a rather odd interrupt system. Uh, I don't know yet whether that will help or not. And over here, if I can find it, here, here is the NSA's amazing reverse engineering tool, Ghidra, looking at the Palmos ROM for this machine. So that I can go look here and figure out what actual running code for this hardware does which is very nice. So, let's get started then. So, the way the interrupt system on a 68000 normally works is each hardware device attached to the system is told which interrupt vector it's supposed to assert when it wants to raise an interrupt. And then there's an enormous table of vectors, which you can see here, which uh, contains the actual address that of the interrupt service routine that's called when the interrupt happens. However, this machine doesn't do that. Instead, there are only seven different vectors here, which you can map to a particular number of user interrupts here. And all the hardware devices will generate one of these. So a lot of the devices will share interrupts. But the first thing we need to do before we can actually do anything that raises an interrupt is initialize the interrupt system. And one of the things we have to do is to tell it which vectors to use. Now, I have, here in Ghidra, I've already done a bunch of work on this. Luckily, the people who made the ROM didn't remove any of the symbol information so it's littered with strings that tell me what all the various routines do, which is rather useful. But I can find the IVR register uh, at address F300, you can see there. Um, and then Ghidra has collated a cross-reference table, so I can go here to the routine called Hardware Pre-RAM Init. I can see that it is being touched twice and Gidra is trying to pop up fragments of the code so you can see that's initializing it to hex 40 what's this one doing update yeah the pop-ups aren't very reliable but I can double click and go there uh, 1 8 that's interesting because the data sheet here says that the minimum value is OX40. Uh, so, vector 18, where's that vector table? Is here. So they're reusing the auto vector table for the interrupt vectors. This machine does not use the auto vector interrupts. Uh, these are a 
on the original 68000, these were a thing to allow old-fashioned devices which didn't know about user interrupt vectors to raise interrupts. So reusing those actually makes a ton of sense. So we're going to do that. So let's find our hardware-specific routine, hardware-specific init routine, which is here. And let's initialize some of this stuff. And we need to define values for the registers. That is a word, isn't it? Nope, it's a byte. And let's just poke at this code a bit. Um, so further up, it set up the RAM. We've done that in our Dana init script. And at this point, it is it's looking at a bit on one on one of the input lines testing it and um, i think i can tell it to not do the yeah there's a bug there you have to click that twice to turn it off Um, interesting. So I don't know what's attached to this device he here on port D, because if that bit is set, then it skips all of this initialization code. But if it's not set, then IVR is never updated and it retains the original value which was set near the top of this routine here, which is hex 40. So I'm not sure what's do, what that's doing. Anyway, let's try 1.8 and see what happens. So this should set the... Oops. So that does actually build. Uh, we also want to set the control register. Yeah, uh, yeah, this. This is all hardware specific and I don't know what hardware is attached. So we're just going to come up here here is the control register. Here is where it's being initialized to it's setting the top bit, which is pole one. So I've no idea what's attached to that at this point. But we're going to have to copy it. That was 302, yep. And 304 is IMR. So let me reset the board. And I can use my tool to uh, print the value of these registers like this. Okay, that's so just printed all registers beginning with an I. We can see that ICR is zero by default. Uh, IMR 
is a 32-bit register. Uh, this allows you to enable or disable individual uh, interrupt sources. And we are going to FFF7 but it's treating this as a word register so that means it's touching the high half so F7 means it is resetting MIRQ1 which is something but by default everything is off so we're going to leave everything off so that will be okay is there anything else we need here the Status register tells us which interrupts have fired since the last time we looked. And we want this to be cleared. 3C, yep. And IPR is the pending register. Uh, if an interrupt source is masked, that is disabled, the hardware will still generate an interrupt, it just won't interrupt the CPU. And instead it will set one of these bits. I th think this is not useful for us for the time being. This one allows you to configure certain pieces of hardware, but not all of them, to which interrupt you want to generate. Which again, we're going to ignore for the time being. So, that should be us setting up the interrupt system, and that's all there is. Now, the fun starts here where we need to initialize the system timer because we're going to have to configure one of our timers and have it generate interrupts and make it do things so yes fun uh, does that actually build no it does not it's not a d word it's a long isn't it And here is the code that is generating, which is just what you would expect it to be. Okay, right, the timer. That's the data sheet. There are two timers that are very nearly but not quite identical. We want to set them running in restart mode so that they count up until a particular value which point the interrupt is generated and the timer resets. We want the timer to run at 200 Hertz or every five milliseconds. Now we can actually the first thing I will do is I will find the timer register here in the ROM TCTL1 and this is being referred to from a routine called hardware timer in it so that's probably a good place to start and here you can see it configuring it and actually I should be able to uh, view decompiler and Ghidra has attempted to turn the machine code into C so here you can see what it's actually doing so we are uh, doing some calculations to uh, presumably figure out the uh, the timer parameters setting it up 
we then enable the timer by, by setting the timer control register and we unmask it to enable it as an interrupt source and our code is going to be almost identical except for this stuff up here which I don't know what it does so what is this doing well actually I'm slightly jumping the gun there so there are two timers timer 1 timer 2 they are nearly identical but timer 2 is more configurable than timer 1 I believe from looking at the source that timer 1 is intended for use as a system timer and timer 2 for something else so I am going to use timer 1 for this it should be easy enough to change if other if it's not so we need to put some register values in tctl1 is a word at 600 Palmos here is setting it to ox33 which is 1101 uh, hang on. Is that doing a byte or a... Here we go. It's setting a word. So, all zeros. One, one, zero. One... Hang on. One, one... Gah. I am failing to turn uh, three into binary properly. Zero zero one one zero zero one one. So now is in setting this bit to enable it, setting clock source to one, setting IRQ enable to on, say you want it to generate an interrupt, and OM here is becoming one. So uh, this bit needs to be reset because you want restart mode. Uh, capture is remaining zero because we're not using the capture functionality. The capture functionality will copy the timer value into another register when an event happens, which is useful for like stopwatches and the time and that kind of thing. Uh, output mode uh, I think this is when you configure the timer to to generate an external pulse to some external device they seem to want it to toggle uh, this one is on clock source was set to one so that's going to be system clock zero zero one and timer enable so we'll just use the same things okay so this was also setting well it's unmasking the appropriate interrupt D here is uh, 1101 so it's unsetting one specific bit. So if we go up to the interrupt mask, 1101 is timer 1. OK. So, so I just copy the same code. Uh, this, so these two values are setting the speed of the timer and the value that will be uh, used to uh, compare the timer against. This is, this is the rollover value. So it will count at the rate determined by this until the timer reaches this and then the timer will trigger. Unfortunately, I've no idea what these parameters here are up to. Um, 
I will just do quickly. Oops, there we go. I'll just remove a lot of the. It's tried to guess what the parameters are and so has mostly got them wrong. So that will improve things a little. So this is this is repeatedly dividing the parameter. Wait a minute. This is the division routine. Where does it get its parameters from? Uh, I think probably D0 and D1 by the looks of it. So let me just add these. Custom storage. Do not like this user interface. It's very cumbersome and slow. Uh, D0. D. Why is that turning into. Oh. Uh, I need to set so much stuff in so many places. Okay, so add storage, it's a register. It's in D1. Okay, and it figured the rest out. So now you can see two parameters coming in. And okay, well, we don't care about that end of the division routine. We care about this end of the division routine. I said this end because now you can see it's figured out the parameters. So this looks like it's dividing something by a hundred. Um, is it getting doesn't appear to be getting a remainder. So I don't know what it's doing. This this will be part of the calculation for the timer parameters. Anyway, let's go look up TPRER, general purpose timers, programming module, prescaler. Well, it's a 16-bit value. Clock source is divided by the value contained in this register. So I think the parameter that it's being given, but it's not doing anything with param one. Well, we can figure out where it's called for, called from, which is inside the startup code. Ha. No, we can't, because what this is actually doing is setting up a set of vectors in memory. So uh, I, I would need to define a structure based on this address and see who tries to access it. Uh, 918. So here's the structure. Can I go? 
go to 122 plus OX918. Aha! So I think this is the place. But it looks like, see, there are no cross references here. It looks like Ghidra hasn't seen any code that actually calls that yet. So this is a pointer. Okay. So no, we can't see what who's calling this. Yeah, this is clearly setting up a jump table that will be used by other bits of Parmos. Anyway, this is no doubt the clock frequency of some description. It's a word. So I can tell it it's a word. It will improve things. But I believe that we're actually going to have to calculate this ourselves. We want a 200 uh, hertz timer, so it's 5 milliseconds. Now there should be an example here, there isn't. Fantastic. I believe that the clock of this thing by default runs at uh, 16 megahertz. So let's see. Uh, so 16 megahertz is about that many ticks. Uh, if we so each tick is this long in seconds. Uh, each of our desired clock ticks is five milliseconds. That's five e minus three. So we want to generate an interrupt every this many clock ticks, which is too big for the 16-bit comparison register. So we are going to... Uh, so if we divide that by 16, that will now fit. So, uh, where's the prescalar definition? So to divide by 16, we have to set the prescalar value to 15. And then when this many ticks happen, we want the interrupt to happen. And the interrupt is, so tcomp1 is the comparison value, which is, yeah, 16 bits. So four, six, oh, four. The system clock on this thing can actually go to 33 megahertz, but I believe it runs at 16 out of the box. And in order to change it, we have to fiddle about with the PLLs, and I don't want to go there yet, or even at all. So this will now generate a interrupt, but we haven't actually put an interrupt handler in, and we don't know what vector it is using. Up here, one of these registers, here we are, in the interrupt level register, it allows you to configure which vector is being used for SPI1, UART2, PWM2, or timer2. However, the timer1 uh, vector is hardwired to 
Um, I think it's level six. Yeah, where is it set to? Okay, this is how you can configure the where where the clocks come from for the timers. Uh, apparently, there is a system clock divided by sixteen. Uh, but it may not be coming from the CPU clock. It may be coming from this much slower crystal oscillator. If so, then we'll need different maths. What is 32 in decimal 50? Right, they're adding 50 here to round the division. Yeah, I am not sure what's going on there. Or rather, I know what it's doing. I'm not sure what the various units mean. Okay, so we are going to need a uh, interrupt handler, and that is going to need to be in machine code. I can go and find the cold fire version of this, which is in cold fire 2.s. And if we scroll down here, for example, is the handler for the cold fires timer. And what this does, this is registered on vector 61, hence the name of the routine. And what it does is it uh, if it returns from the interrupt back into normal code but as it does so, it fakes a, a subroutine call to the to an emutos's timer handler, which is vector five ms. So in fact, we are going to want to copy the same code. I haven't looked for vector 5ms yet. That's in uh, where is that? So I would expect something would be assigning A value. Ah, here it. That's not it. Int timers. Ah, yeah. Right. This is the routine that actually does the work. So let's go find that. Right, which is another machine code routine in vectors.c, which is this. And this is why, yeah, this is why we have to go through all these hoops because it's not a normal C routine. That's an exciting piece of code, to be honest. 
Okay, we're going to need a routine. So we're just going to copy what the cold fire does and call it that. We could put some of our startup code in here, like the, the cold fire's done, but honestly, I'd prefer to use C. But we are going to have to actually set up that vector. So let's uh I'd be st I still haven't figured out which level it is being uh which vector it's actually wired to. Thirty-two bit timers, compare and capture. Uh Interrupt enable. Timer status. That's all there is. Sys clocks, clock 16, clock 32, or an external clock pin. And we are setting it to clock source 001, system clock. Whatever system clock happens to be. Generation. So I think it is mm, I think it's interrupt six. No. Interrupt timer X interrupts issue to the interrupt controller if the IQ enable bit is set. Right, so I don't think I think this isn't documented here. I think this is documented in um here so oh you go timer unit one level six so that is going to be yeah auto vector and in interrupt number six which is at well, it is vector one e. So we do need to set this here. How was the cold fire setting the vectors? Here we go. Interrupt vector. Uh, one e was six. Yep. Yeah. 
30 equals Dana int 6. And in fact, this could be used by other things, so we're going to put it there. Ah. I don't think interrupt vector is standard. <laughs> okay. Exception vector. Tell me this is not also a cold fire thing. Yes, it is. Okay, we are going to steal this because it's useful. Um, or are we? Let's go see how the Amiga does it. So I know that the we go int VBL is an interrupt handler. So this is the vertical blanking interrupt Amiga VBL. So where is this getting set up? Here we go. Vec level three. This sounds more like our thing, to be honest. And I bet that's defined in Amiga.h. No, it's defined in BIOS vectors.h. Okay. Uh, hex address 64. Level one auto vector, right? These are already pointing at the auto vector vectors. So all we need to do is to say vec level six, right? And this will fail because this is not initialized anywhere because we need to declare that. Dana in six. And then this will now fail to link because we haven't put it in our make file. So all we need to do is put this in and build. Right, and it links. So if we run this, it should actually set up a timer. And then when the timer fires, it will call this routine, which will just drop out into the middle of nowhere and everything will crash and burn horribly. So what we're going to do now is to copy the cold fire code I need to check that number because the cold fire is not very 68,000 like in some ways and the exception vectors might be different. So we push SR onto the stack. That will show up as a parameter. I have no idea what this is, but we push that onto the stack too.
we load the five millisecond vector value from memory into a register and we call it. Now there's a cold fire int 61 ack routine here. Oh, I've missed a bit. I have missed a bit. Right, before we do this, right, we need to push the... We need What we're doing here is we're discarding the old exception stack frame, and now we are setting up a new stack frame. So that has the return address, which is going to be this routine here. Uh, we then push SR and we push the, yeah, that pushes SR and then we push this magical number here and then we jump to the handler. And on exit, we put things back approximately the way they were. Well, I've also missed a bit, which is to save registers that we're using onto the stack. Um, I am um, I'm trying to translate the machine code dialect. Right, now what this is doing in the acknowledge code uh, I'm gonna have to go look up what RTE does. I know it's returned from exception, but I need to know the details. Okay, RTE pops. Ah, uh, it pops. SR and PC. So we are pushing. PC and SR, but then we're pushing this other magic thing. So This comment is wrong. Uh, what this is doing is it's subtracting 16 from the stack pointer. It's making space for uh, four words, the four words here. So we are leaving the old exception stack frame exactly as was. We're simply creating a new stack frame on top of it, which when, retra which when retracted over when our vector handler calls RTE will in fact jump to here. So what we're going to do here is we are going to restore the registers that we saved we are then going to 
discard the stack frame where we put those registers and return from the interrupt proper. Now the cold fire here is acknowledging the interrupt. This is a thing some architectures need to do where you tell the hardware that the interrupt has now been serviced and it stops asserting it. I do not know whether this platform requires it. Um, I th looking at this, I think we do. Uh, when programmed as edge triggered interrupts, external. Oh no, here we are. All interrupts from internal peripheral devices are level triggered interrupts. The interrupt handler, they are cleared at the requesting sources. So either we need to tell the timer that we've cleared it. Or we don't do anything. looking to see if I can find something talking about clearing. The status register did mention it, but I'm not sure that was relevant. Control bit. Capture. Hmm. Well, over here in the Palmos code, we should be able to find our vector at level 6. Our vector is at address 7, 8. So if we go all the way to the top of memory and find address 7, 8, which is here, uh, which is vector uh, IRQ6V. And this is being referred to from here. So these two addresses close to each other look promising. This is not a function I've looked at yet. So what's it called? Hardware sleep. Um, unfortunately, Gidra is a little bit confused because the Palmos code is riddled with these, which are system calls, and it uses the uh, the next two bytes are some kind of payload and Ghidra just gets thoroughly confused by them. So here it is this might be waking up from sleep and reprogramming everything You can see it's setting IRQ setting the vector to something. There's some source code, some disassembly there. So what's it setting it to here? Well, this routine which if we disassemble it is very small and it is a function and it is called prove wake up int handler 
Okay, this is part of the code that wakes up after it goes to sleep. So that is not what we care about. It would be, yeah, it's setting all the interrupt vectors to this routine. So that presumably when uh, the system is, wakes up from an interrupt, it calls this thing and it then proceeds and wakes up back into full state as part of the power management for the platform. But it's not what we wanted. But uh, so if you go back to the vector itself, uh, there's another couple of uses where it's written to here. Uh, this is the same piece of code. Because it hasn't, Gidra hasn't figured out that this is all the same function. Cursors. All right, so it has unfortunately let me down here. I was hoping that I'd be able to see where the where this was originally being initialized and then go and find the handler itself. Well, here we have the actual startup code, which is all a bit weird, which eventually we end up mm, why do we have two mains to find so something here is probably going to initialize all the vectors this piece of code is clearing all the workspace at this address which is higher than we wanted This is setting up a vector of some description. Uh, what's at address B C? Uh, it's the right. This, that is the trap fifteen instruction. So I actually want to name that. Hang on, it's already got a name. Trap Dispatcher. Uh, this I don't know what it does. It's a private subroutine which doesn't have a name. but I don't think it's useful for me. Yeah, I was hoping to find something in here that sets up the vectors, but I don't think I have. That is a shame. Well, one thing we could do is if, if the interrupt is cleared by resetting the status bit, which actually seems likely, we can simply go to 60A. Uh, look at the wrong place. Six O A is is that the right address? That's here. T stat one. Which does not appear to be used by anyway by anything. This is a word, but there are no cross-references. So Gidra has not yet seen any code that refers to that address, which is interesting. It 
If this sentence here worries me, to be cleared these bits must first be examined and the bit must have a value of 1. Now I don't know whether the hardware actually enforces that. Is it saying that I have to read it and look at the value before I can clear it? Or can I just write 0 to tstat1 and clear it? I think I'm just going to assume that I can do that. So uh, tstat1 and tstat1 is at ff ff f60a So we have an image with hopefully all the timer stuff in it. Although I'm still curious about this mysterious thing. So that was in vectors.s uh, int timer c is here. Oh, ouch. But why isn't... This seems complicated. Yeah, this this does not seem right to me. Um So this routine must end with an RTE, so we have to go through at least some of this junk in order to uh, set that up. This, this status word is only valid on the cold fire, so we can get rid of that. So we have a simple stack frame from this. We do need to save D0 and A0. Because... Uh, we have to use D0 to push the status register and we have to use A0 in order to do this indirect jump. We don't need to save D1 and A1. So why are we? So this will Yeah, I think that is now more or less right. So let's uh write it and execute it and see what happens. So it's downloaded, and let's run it, and it instantly crashes. Okay, well, I cannot honestly say I'm surprised. So let, the first thing we're going to do is just try removing this. 
because this should now turn this into a very simple interrupt handler which pushes some stuff but then doesn't pop it off again. Let me take a look at that cold fire code. Yeah, of course, this gets these two words are supposed to be popped off by the RTE instruction. So let's do that. And then we just have to, whoops, didn't want to run it again. And now we just have to write it and run it and see if that makes a difference. So does this still crash? Yes, it does. Okay, that's fine. So let's just replace this with something even simpler. Acknowledge timer interrupt and return. And we write and we execute it and we see what happens. All right, execute. And it crashes. Okay, next step. We're going to turn this off. We're no longer setting up the timer. Uh, if this still crashes, then something's wrong with our configuration here. And run it. Okay, that proceeds, but didn't produce the splash screen. Interesting. Well, so this suggests that there is something not right with my timer configuration. Let's do everything except enable the timer. Uh, so enable the interrupt. I am expecting this to work, to be honest. I think that this is not hooked up to the quote system clock unquote. I think it's hooked up to something else. Uh, it said sys clock timer control bit. Here we go. Uh, so let's go look for sys clock in the documentation. What is this clock? Clock generation. Okay, sys clock here is fast. That looks like the CPU clock, and here is the 32 kilohertz crystal clock from elsewhere. So that does suggest that sys clock is indeed the uh, CPU clock, which is running at 16 megahertz. Okay, well, run. Interest, ah, oh, for heaven's sake. Let's do it that way around, shall we? 
yeah, each time I have to reset it, do a write, and pause the video, it uses up 30 to 45 seconds at this end, and uh, about the same amount of time again when I have to edit all this back together. The coding videos are actually really easy to edit. Okay. Uh, as there's just all the segments concatenated together. The workbench videos are much trickier because I have to like make creative decisions. Right, uh, what I suspect is happening is that we are not acknowledging the interrupt. So the first time our interrupt comes along and uh, generates an interrupt and then the interrupt handler here is serviced but the interrupt is still asserted when this thing exits. So it goes right back into the uh, interrupt handler again. And in fact, I can test this by doing Um, I want it to be one on success. So if that hypothesis is correct, then we should get a stream of at signs uh, as the interrupt handler keeps getting reinvoked. And I forgot to re-enable the timer. Um, I wonder also um, if I I just want to change these numbers. So sixteen megahertz approximately. I'll divide that by two five six. So multiply that by two five six gives this many ticks. What's my doing? I want to try and set the timer to produce approximately one pulse a second, because that will make debugging easier. So at 16 megahertz, this is going to need to be, well, clearly, uh, 16 E6 ticks per interval. However, that is way too big for our 16-bit um, comparison. So if we divide that by the maximum value, which is 256, we get this, which will just fit. So divide by 256. Comparison is 62500. And let's give this a try. I'm interested to see whether we get slow at signs or a whole stream of at signs or no at signs in a hang. All right, well, what's this going to do? That's my execute. Nothing at all. Interesting. So what is it doing? Maybe that we can't actually set IVR to OX18, and that's just not allowed. We did see the Palmos code doing it. It's being written to in this code too, which is... 
setting it to 1 8 and initializing some things Now we haven't received any at signs at all. Which does seem peculiar. So maybe it hasn't hit this code at all. Maybe I am not configuring things correctly here. Let's just take a look at this Dana in it. Okay, VEC level 6 is writing a value to hex 7, 8. So to check this. Yep, 7, 8 is indeed level 6 interrupt auto vector. Uh, we configure IVR, ICR, IMR. IVR. ICR is a word. IMR is at 304 and is a long, and we're setting it to all Fs. Wait a minute. Right, what I was doing there it was unmasking these, which could be doing anything. These actually look like external interrupts. These are IRQ 1 to and 1 to 5, uh, SPI, uh, RTI, real-time clock, emulator interrupt. So if these happen to be asserting interrupts, then that would cause very bad things to happen, like it's spinning furiously, waiting for a interrupt to be cleared. So let's try that. All right, and we execute, and fantastic. OK, well, it's no longer hanging, but we're also not getting any at signs. I wonder if we waited long enough, would one show up? Uh, what is actually left in this code? We are clearing the timer and writing an at sign, and that's it. So let's put this back and see if anything shows up. Yes, having an actual debugger would make a big difference, as well as an in-circuit emulator. In-circuit emulators are fantastically expensive, and no, I don't have one. All right, and now let's try it. No at signs. Also interesting. One thing I could have that would help is an emulator, but I haven't been able to find a Dragon Ball VZ emulator. I mean, we're not using any Palm-specific hardware here. It's all built-in functionality, so uh, it sh this code should just drop in and work once you configure where all the RAM is.
that's interesting. Uh, we do not have the prompt appearing to say, you know, welcome to EmuCon. So is it hung? It could very well have. I, it might have hung on this. Do I? Did I get that right? UTX one is at nine oh six. Yes, it is. The data is at nine oh seven. Let me try this. Oops, a All right, so execute and still nothing. Okay, I wasn't really expecting that to do anything. So has this actually called the interrupt? I think it must have, otherwise it wouldn't have hung. Because if we don't unmask the interrupt, everything is fine. So of the interrupt control registers, This one is not relevant for us. The mask register, excuse me, yawning, is the one where we actually unmask our interrupt. We know that is working. The service register Yeah, we looked at that before. Interrupts from internal devices are cleared at the requesting sources. So we can write to these, but it won't help. Where is it? Timer one. This bit indicates that a timer one has occurred. This is a level six interrupt. But they are read write. This documentation is a little com confusing. So for like IRQ6 here, which is not the same as a level six, well, as the timer interrupt. Uh, it says the interrupt must be cleared by writing a one to this bit. But five up here says source of the interrupt must first be cleared, but doesn't say how. So the level six interrupt is actually shared by several different peripherals. We know timer one is one. We know IRQ six is another, but we haven't unmasked IRQ six in the IMR. So that we should never get one of those. But if the interrupt vector was being called, I would expect to see an at sign So um, I think that is not being called. One thing it is worth doing 
is just we manually call the ISR there we should see one at sign appear that will just let us verify that the routine itself works so why is this hanging how can we find out well I think the first useful thing to do is to go into BIOS.C and enable the copious tracing. Uh, oh yeah, this, this tracing is, appears in screen.c and we can actually turn that off. So let's see what comes out now. Okay, execute. So, we've just called init system timer, which is our code, which is here. We've seen the first at sign, and then it all halts. So this indicates that everything is going bad immediately after I unmask the interrupt. Let's take another look at the Parmos code. Uh, I'm looking for T control one timer in it. This doesn't look sophisticated. Where is clock frequency being set? Uh, pre debug in it. Private calculate nipper pulse width value. Well. That looks like uh, that's three point six million. Now I there was that divide by hundred in the clock code. So I wonder, is that a fixed point value? 36864. Uh, there's some stuff in here about the clock crystal. A couple of values. There's two standard values, one of which was 332.768 kilohertz. but there was another value. Thirty-eight point four kilohertz. That actually looks suspicious. If that is thirty-eight point four in sixteen bit fixed point. But the timer code here is dividing things in decimal. We have 100 here and 50 here. OK, let's see where else this is set from. Here. Interesting. Ah, oh, here. Right, it's... Uh, 
This is calculating something based on the PLL configuration. So let's go and look at the PLL configuration. The PLL is the um, the oscillator that drives all the clocks in the system. So PLL FSR PLL frequency select reg register. So U var two is the value shift by eight, that's QC. So we should be able to rename that. Uh, this PLL FSR, this is the bottom byte, that is PC. So that's multiplying PC by 14 yeah this actually requires knowledge of how PLLs work which I don't have but this is PCX14 So this is the value that we actually get out of the calculation. And why is this code writing the value to clock frequency twice. That's odd. Well, let us reset the board and use the tool to figure out what PLL FSR is set to. 8347. So, QC is 3, uh, PC is 4, 7, so let's just do it this way around, PC is OX 4, 7, PC X 14 is therefore PC times 14, which is 994. So, this is some kind of odd code, to be honest. So we add 15, then we shift left by 15, and then we shift right by 1. So this is the multiplication. Ah, right, this add L is an extra left shift, so that's shifting by, that's, that's doubling it, which is a shift of 1, so that's actually shifting left by 16. Why doesn't it use a swap instruction?
and then we shift right by one. Well, okay, so what is PCX14 plus QC and why is QC being ended with three, oh yeah, it's, it, that's extracting the It's extracting these six bits, including these two bits that aren't used for anything. So plus OX15 is 1018. So what is 1018 times that? Right, this is the value that clock frequency is being set to. Um, honestly, that looks very much like 33 megahertz. I was pretty sure the system was running 16 megahertz from the trouble I was having with the board rate uh, when I was trying to get the debug tool working. Okay, so where is our timer in it routine? Let's just Let's just copy this. The user interface is quite old and it doesn't support all the the right uh, clipboard stuff. So so you are for is I. This is. Divided clock is clock frequency plus 50 divided by 100. Prescale value is initialized to DC. While Prescale value is too big. Keep doubling the divisor value. Hang on, I'm going to do this more cleverly. Okay, so uvar four is the comparison value. That's uh, no, it's not. Uvar four is the prescale value. Uvar one is um, our divided clock. uvar2 is our comparison value Let's assign some types This is comparison value, so
So I think this 100 here is our clock frequency. That is, this will generate a 100 ticks per second. Somehow. So that's not going to work. It's not D word, it's U long. So let's see if this actually does anything up. And let's try this. All right, so now when we execute it, then nothing happens. See, I was kind of expecting this line of printing to produce something. Because this hasn't actually done anything particularly uh, exotic. I wonder is it... It can't have hit a division by zero error. Oh, for heaven's sake. Right, we can't call Dana in 6 there because that's an interrupt handler and it terminates with RTE. Uh, RTS is for subroutines, RTE is for uh, interrupt handlers. So that was always going to crash there. That was just not helpful. So let's try this again. Okay, now I've gone through this code, I actually understand what it's doing, which is this is the desired clock, and it keeps halving that, keeping track of how often it has to uh, adjust the scale value until what's left is a comparison value that will fit. So this is calculating the appropriate timer for the calculated clock frequency and the uh, the interval we want the interrupts to happen. So it's actually good that I figured that code out. And I think I will actually also go and copy the PLL code wherever that got to. It's here somewhere. It was here. I will copy that in uh, because then that will pull the appropriate clock frequency from the PLL configuration. Okay, execute. It got further. All right, now here we go. Here is the prescale and CV values we got. So, what I think's happened here is that it set everything up. It's working, the timer is running, it goes on and does some more work, then a timer interrupt happens and it crashes. But we haven't received an at sign. So the question is,
have I correctly set the the IVR? Is this a legal value? I mean, we've seen it in the code here. Let me just copy that for reference. Has it hung somewhere here? I can't imagine it could. Are these interrupts different from normal 68,000 interrupts? Well, I don't think so. But it occurs to me that I can very easily figure that out. So an RTE is a 4E73. So go to the top of the code, search memory for 4E73. So this then finds all the RTEs in the ROM, and there aren't very many. Here's one. This is the trap dispatcher. So this is what gets executed when a trap instruction uh, is called. Is there a search next? Repeat search. Uh, so here is some code. This looks like the fatal exception handler. I can tell by the big words of fatal exception. Here. Um, here's some more code. Trap dispatcher again. Well, this is a function called Trap Dispatcher. What's this one? That's interesting. There's debugger in this ROM. Be, might be useful to find. So DD22 is where that RTE was. So that was here. So I'm going to guess that this does actually look like an exception handler. So you push something onto the stack. We do some work. And eventually we pop two things off the stack, but we only pushed one on a four. Uh, anyway, I don't think that's what I'm looking for. There's some more. Also does not look like 
a simple piece of code. Yeah, these routines don't seem to have strings in them. So I can't tell easily what they do without having to, you know, read the code and figure it out. Hardware low battery handler. Well, that does sound like an interrupt. And it's an ordinary function which starts here, so... Hardware low battery handler. So what is what is this doing? We push some stuff onto the stack. We do some stuff. We possibly call a routine. And we exit. Can I see where this is actually set from? It's read from here. It's referred to... there oh no I'm looking at the parameters not the actual routine itself the cross references for the routine here would appear there underneath it and they're not so the, it, it hasn't seen any cross references for that yet hardware doc status uh, what about this one Looking for strings. Don't see any. Hmm. This looks like jump table stuff. Yep, here is the jump table. This looks like an exceedingly minimal uh, what is this is popping lots of registers off the stack and then doing an RTE right I think think we've just found a context switcher. So I think that this is called to restore the state of the CPU for, based on a structure in memory. So I think that if we eventually find a string at the bottom of this, this will be some kind of microkernel threading context switcher stuff. Target CFG routines. I have no idea what that does. Okay, well, several of these. What's, what's this one? Three one e. That's in the middle of this string, so it's spurious. And then we have this RT in the middle of nowhere. which doesn't look like code. No, this does not look like code. You see the disassembler keeps failing because it's found stuff that doesn't exist. So I think this is spurious. Yeah, look, there's some zeros here immediately above the RTE. So let's tell it that's not code. Right, well, we found lots of RTEs, none of which seem to help. So that was good. There's some stuff here. So this appears to be looking at opcodes. This could be some kind of debugger core.
and there aren't any strings. Well, I think that's actually taken us precisely nowhere. Never mind. Um, however, some cross references here look like they've shown up. What was the what was our level six address seven eight Oh, we've already seen these, yeah, it's the this code that we don't know what it does. Right, well, okay, so we seem to be getting an interrupt and then immediately stopping. And the options are that we've actually set this for the wrong interrupt. Now, we set the base vector to 1, 8, which is here. So level zero, which is a spurious interrupt that's not part of this table, is one eight. Then we have one nine, one a, one b, one c, one d, one e, and one e is our level six interrupt auto vector, which is where we put the. Uh, which we set up here. So if that's not allowed and one eight doesn't do what I think it does, then we have to set this to like four zero. Four zero maps the interrupt to user vectors uh 40 up so that will appear at 100 zero zero up then we have to change this actually before I do that let's just do this first let's set all of those to Dana in six. So now, if any interrupt shows up, it will be routed to the correct interrupt handler, as opposed to just crashing the board. So let's see if this makes any difference. All right, execute, and it hangs. Well, I think I am going to try setting it to the 100 addresses. and just see if that makes a difference. I don't think it will. Okay. L value required as left side of operand. And let's try this. Okay, so execute. 
Ooh, that's different. Yes. That's because I was stupid. Yeah, it's getting late and I'm getting a bit tired. That was an unlined access error. And that, by the way, is you want exceptions on un unaligned accesses so that when you make stupid mistakes like this, you know about them rather than just filling the vector table with garbage. And run it. Hmm. Interesting. Has that done what I thought it had? Did I remember to make it? Apparently I didn't. <laughs> okay. Ooh, interesting. Right, what did that do? Um, panics at that address. And then it immediately starts spewing incredibly corrupt looking tracing. Okay, well at least we have an address now, so that's more than we had for 6B54. Econ out one, right. Uh, that's not produced anything particularly useful. It's just died inside the routine that's supposed to trace that's that writes the console. So something is horribly corrupt. I don't think that has really helped, unfortunately. 640. Did I get the right address? 6B54. Yeah. Right, 6400 is inside panic. It's panicked in panic. And then it just repeats. Hmm. But this does seem to be different than before. I also see no at signs. Yeah, I'm just double checking the addresses again. Oh, yes, and I did notice, but then forgot about, that all those addresses were wrong. There was one too many F. It looks like the compiler has truncated them down to 32 bits, so that seems to have worked, but it's still not brilliant. So why has it panicked? Inside con out. Well, you see here it got halfway through printing something. So panicking inside con out suggests that something was corrupted. Inside con out itself. So if it tried to call this and something went wrong and you ended up with corrupt registers that would cause bad things to happen but I very carefully didn't use any registers in any of this code just check the disassembly to make sure it actually does
What happens if you just put an RTE in? Okay, so this then does exactly the same. It is at least consistent. So I think it's not reaching this interrupt handler somehow. So this suggests that it's not calling the right thing. Well, if IVR is set to OX40, then then it should be being mapped to vectors uh i think 6 4 and up the vectors at no of course uh, the vectors for 0 and up at this address. And there's a reference here that uh, if the IVR is not set then interrupt number OXOF is returned as an uninitialized interrupt with vector 3C. So OXOF vector 3C is not here So, uh, how do I do this? Okay, uh, vector zero is at zero, so this should just be I times four. So vec user becomes vector um, IVR plus I. So vector. OXF is uninitialized interrupt vector. That's 15. So is this the one that's being called? Let's try that. Okay, so now we execute and it crashes in precisely the same way. So that hasn't helped. But this address is different now. <laughs> that is one of the classic mistakes with macros. Because I put IVR plus I in here, that was textually substituted in here so that it ended up being IVR plus I times 4. So it read IVR and it added I times 4 to it rather than reading IVR and adding I, then multiplying the result by 4. I should know better than that. Okay, let's try this. What happens? It crashes. And our addresses are right back the way they were. Okay. So that's done nothing. So as soon as we turn the, we enable the interrupt, let me see, D is 1101. That should be enabling the correct interrupt. It then immediately dies. 
well, not anymore. It dies a little bit later. Oh yeah, uh, in another stunning example of incompetence, the problems I was having the other day with unaligned accessors because the screen was 540 pixels wide, which is not an even number of 8 pixel wide characters, well actually I had misremembered the width of the screen, so it's, actually, it's supposed to be that, and that's fine. Uh, 560 is 70 characters wide, so yay. So I'm wondering if there's something funny about the Dragon Ball exceptions. So I'll just go and scour the documentation. I'll do that offline, I think. So uh, it turns out that the interrupts are indeed perfectly normal and you exit them with an RTE. However, I discovered one incredibly stupid mistake. Let me just undo this. I was doing IVR plus I here, uh, reading the base vector out of the IVR register, which only gets set up after I initialize all the vectors. So IVR is set to some garbage and it was just writing random stuff. So I've hopefully corrected that, so let's see what happens. Oh yes, he's been panicking. That didn't actually make any difference. Fabulous. Well, I can verify the code. It does actually seem to have done the right thing. So you can see here that vec user 6 has written the address to uh, yeah, ignore these names here. It's the name in the relocation that's important. Um, has in fact written to address 018 uh, which uh, yes 118 which is in the right range yes um, I also went and looked up the Linux source code uh, rather the UC Linux source code and it's doing everything in a perfectly normal fashion. Uh, so here you can see it setting up all the vectors. Uh, here you can see it initialize the IVR to 64, turn off all interrupts, uh, initialize the default handlers, where it's handle level IRQ. There's more in here. So well here is a standard interrupt handler which uh does very much the same kind of thing I was doing. It saves the vector number onto the stack, does the thing, pop it all off. The return the returning is more complicated in Linux because it's doing task switching. So there's this huge chunk of code that tries to context switch, which I'm not doing. So I'm still somewhat puzzled, I have to say. So I think I think what I'm going to do is basically fiddling with this isn't achieving anything. Um, I am certain there's an emulator somewhere that may be able to help. If I can actually see what it's doing, then this should be straightforward. So I was kind of hoping to get more done today, but 
part of the reasoning behind doing this all on video is to document how painful some of it is so yeah it's painful so I'm gonna come back next time with hopefully some better news and hopefully we'll make some progress for a change I hope you enjoyed this video I'm back I found a thing look at this tracing BIOS in it Dana in it where we set up our vectors blah 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 VEX in it. VEX in it is in BIOS BIOS.C. What does this do? It initializes all the vectors. In it, what does in it user vec do? It's not in that file for a start. Uh, it's in init user vec it erases all the user vectors so what's happening is that no matter what vectors we set here they are being stomped on a bit later down the initialization process yay okay so let's take that out of there And put this in here. Of course, this happens much further down the line in in its system timer down here. And let's try this. And while that writes, I'm just going to take a quick look at this. Yes, we still have the the at sign stuff. Okay, and now let's run it and see what happens. And we get at signs. It was as simple as that. Fantastic. So, yeah. That was a good hour or so wasted. Never mind, now we know it works. I wouldn't have gone through the process to figure this stuff out if I hadn't and I have more of an understanding of how this works so that's good uh, yes and hopefully we're receiving 100 at signs a second but I'm not going to do anything more with that now I'm going to wrap it and come back to that later now I hope you've enjoyed this video and please let me know what you think in the comments